Drake. <laughs> Charlie Welch. And myself, Chris Smith, I'll be helping moderate this awesome discussion that we hope to have between Eric, who's been on the ground in Madagascar working to protect lemurs and also study them and just try to learn as much as we can about animals that we really don't know a whole lot about. And then Charlie Welch, who is actually the conservation coordinator at the Duke Lemur Center, uh, working with the center to coordinate programs in Durham, uh, doing things like distance learning with schools, but also managing programs on the ground in Madagascar, where we're doing everything we can to learn about, protect, and just love these amazing creatures. To get things started, uh, this is all coming together as part of a documentary that's being released on Animal Planet tonight at 8 o'clock in about 45 minutes called Madagascar Lemurs and Spies, featuring Dr. Patel, his work with the Silkies, but also some very important conservation developments that have happened uh, in recent years, or I should say that have escalated in recent years, with the illegal logging and export of precious wood in Madagascar that has, in particular, threatened some very endangered, critically endangered species of lemur like the silky shafak or the rough lemurs of northeast Madagascar. So to get started, um, I thought by way of introducing Eric Patel and Charlie, um, Eric, if you'd like to, could you tell us a little bit of your background, um, how you got started doing lemur research and then in conservation? Yeah, well, I first went to Madagascar in the year 2000. I was just about to start my PhD program at Cornell University, and I saw this, oh, I, I didn't have a lot of jungle experience. You know, I'd worked with primates in a variety of settings, but never really in the rainforest. And I had a summer before I started at Cornell, and I saw this ad for a volunteer to collect uh, lemur poop, lemur fecals in, in Madagascar. And I thought that sounded great, actually, because I had this feeling that once I started my degree, that I wouldn't have time for anything. So I went out there. It was the summer of the year 2000, and I, I just loved it. The, the, the people were, were, were so kind and, and, and very, very poor. But also the animals were amazing. There were more than 100 species of lemur, more than 100 species of primate on one island. It's, it, was, it was phenomenal. And it completely just opened up my eyes um, to the to the whole world of lemurs and, and everything that all the biodiversity that Madagascar harbors. And from there, I, I learned that there were a few species that hadn't been studied yet. And one of the professors there, Dr. Patricia Wright, suggested that maybe I take a look at the silky safakas in the northeast of Madagascar in Marojeji. And they hadn't been studied yet, um, but it would be hard. It would be mountainous but maybe it was worth a shot, and uh, that's how it all got started. That sounds awesome. I haven't been through the jungles of Madagascar yet, but uh, you, you're going to have to take me now. <laughs> we, you're going to have to be my personal tour guide. They want, you know, we, we welcome people out there, it's, and the jungles of Madagascar are actually a lot easier than the jungles... In, in most parts of the world. That's our little secret, you know. <laughs> <laughs> there's no poisonous snakes. Um, there's um, no large mammals that can really hurt you. Um, to speak of, um, there are um, some scorpions and, you know, some poisonous spiders, but really it's, uh, it's a lot easier than, say, working in the, in the rainforest of Indonesia or um, places like that. So, yeah, we have some advantages. Um, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Thanks. And Charlie, your conservation coordinator at the Lemur Center, which I failed to mention, by the way, the Duke Lemur Center is the world's largest sanctuary for captive lemurs. We have more than 240 primates on 85 acres. That makes us kind of special. Only Eric's Island of Madagascar has more lemurs than we do. And that's where Charlie's office is at. Um, so... Charlie, could you give us a, just a little bit of background on how you got involved in lemur conservation? Well, my, my background's a bit different from, from Eric's. I, um, 
<clears throat> excuse me, I, I have a zoo background. I worked in uh, zoos since I was summers when I was in high school. And um, as I went through college, I continued to work at zoos, and even after college I did, but I also had an opportunity to, do, um, to work as a research assistant uh, in the tropics, uh, doing research on different primates, howler monkeys, and, and spider monkeys, but it, it really gave me a, a taste for, for, for what, it, what it would be like to live in another country and do that, that kind of work. And um, I just became more and more interested in, in primates and then narrowed that down even more to, to lemurs and ended up at the, uh, at the Duke Lemur Center and eventually at uh, my wife and I went to Madagascar in first in 1987 at the invitation of the Malagasy government uh, to help them with uh, training in, in captive management of some lemurs that they had at a park there. We were Madagascar was beginning to open up during the late 80s and, and the Lemur Center was working more and more closely with the Water and Forest Department. So we went to a park that was called, um, is still called, Park Ivaluina in Tamatav, eastern Madagascar, and started working there with them on lemur husbandry. Um, and it really grew, the project grew, and we began to see that if we really wanted to have a conservation impact in Madagascar, we were going to have to do a lot more than just work specifically with, with lemurs. So one by one, we added on different activities to the project, um, environmental education, reforestation, working in sustainable agriculture as, a, as, a, as an alternative to slash and burn. Um, but we found eventually we, my wife and I found that we had lived there for 15 years and, and been working in, in conservation with, with the people there. And, um, the organization that, that was behind our work there was actually a conservation consortium known as the Madagascar Fauna Group of which the Duke Lemur Center is a founding and managing member. And that is how the, the Lemur Center got into conservation, first got into conservation in Madagascar. And we continue to be involved with the Madagascar Fauna Group, these, the projects at Ivaluin and now as well uh, a reserve at Betampuna is a, is a natural reserve, nature reserve near Ivaluin. And uh, all that work uh, continues with the, with the MFG. And now as... Uh, as I think Chris mentioned, uh, the Lemur Center has embarked on this independent conservation project in northeastern Madagascar in the area, the Sava region of northeastern Madagascar, which is uh, the area where the uh, the silkies are. Marajeji National Park is where they're where they're centered, and and Eric has come to to work with us on the ground there now. And I'm based, as Chris also said based at the Lemur Center now instead of in Madagascar. Long explanation. <laughs> so the, the one is um, that you came to Lemurs, Madagascar, science conservation through completely, almost completely different channels. Eric, the academic, um, going to Madagascar to actually do scientific research and study these animals and then being led into conservation, Charlie working with them hands-on through captive conservation with a zoo background. Mm -hmm. But the constant are the animals, the lemurs. Um, so I don't know what, why lemurs? And I guess, Eric, for you, if you wanted, why Silky Shafak? But what is it about these animals? Well, Silky Shafak is our a flagship species. For, for northeastern Madagascar. A lot of people come to visit Maro Jeji only to see the Silky Sifakas, and we really don't get much tourism, you know, compared to some of the other big parks in Madagascar that get thousands of tourists a year. At Maro Jeji, we only get a few hundred. But most of those few hundred are coming to see the Silky Sifaka. 
So it is a big tourist draw, but even though we don't have the huge numbers, and and their numbers are so small, you know, why Stony Brook University researchers a little bit, but there hadn't been a long-term study, and, and that was our main motivation. And not only that, they're so rare. With with less than two thousand individuals remaining, they are one of the rarest animals in the world. I I think there are fewer silky safakas than than there are polar bears, spotted owls, or um, many other many other rare animals like that and their numbers are going down you know although we where we're lucky we have Maro Jeji where they are safe and in some of the high mountains of Maro Jeji perhaps um, their numbers are going down outside of Maro Jeji and so it's a it's a desperate situation for them but uh, it's also an exciting time because we're seeing a lot of the investment of Duke Lemur Center really starting to turn the tide on the ground. And just if I could just uh, build a little bit on what, what Eric said, you know, the silkies are incredibly important. They are a flagship species. Lemurs around Madagascar often serve as flagship, uh, flagship species. Madagascar is the only place that lemurs exist. When a species of lemur is gone from Madagascar, it's gone from the world forever. But as a flagship species, they allow us also, they, they help us to protect forested area. There's a lot more in that forest than just silky, silky fox. And so by protecting that forest, we're protecting a, a lot more than just those, just those lemurs. And uh, the forest uh, in that area where the, the silkies are in northeastern Madagascar is, is some of the most biodiverse uh, forest in within the country of Madagascar you get enormous uh, gradients altitude gradients so you get a variation of both uh, flora and fauna at, at different elevations and um, so the the silkies the silkies are, are extremely important and extremely rare but um, they really enable us to protect everything that's that's there and I would also add um, out of the meeting from this past June, Eric, that I think you actually attended the IUCN Red List Assessment. Yeah, that's right. Lemurs, where 91% of all lemur species were classified as vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered. Yeah. Making lemurs the most endangered mammal on the planet. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're talking out of yeah. Things that we hear about in the news, I would think frequently, things like polar bears, whales, yeah, yeah. lemurs are actually at the top of the list. Yeah, yeah. But maybe not quite so high up in the public consciousness. Absolutely right. I mean, we we do have the three Madagascar children's cartoon films, which <laughs> which has actually helped some with name recognition, but it but it's not the same as the public really being aware of, of the crisis that, that we're under. You know, um, bushmeat hunting has really increased in the last um, three, four years, particularly since the political crisis in Madagascar in 2009. And that's one reason that, that they, they made a lot of these recent uplisting in, in conservation statuses at the last IUCN meeting. That's one reason why a lot of lemurs that, that had a lower conservation status, for example, the Indri, which was endangered for many years, was uplisted to critically endangered because there had been a large up, upsurge in, in hunting. And that, that's true of many lemurs. So yeah, as a group, uh, according to the IUCN Red List, lemurs are the most threatened group of mammals with 91% of the species being in one of the, the three highest categories, critically endangered, endangered, or uh, threatened. Yeah. Yeah. So, with, with lemurs under such duress and stress in their environment, um, and Charlie, this might be a good question for you, but Eric, I also want you to, to jump in. Um, can you talk a little bit about the efforts that Duke Lemur Center has actually been involved in on the ground in Madagascar to try to bring substantive change. 
Well, it's difficult. Um, it's, you know, I mentioned the work, our work with the Madagascar fauna group already. And mm -hmm. um, it's difficult in that Madagascar is a very poor country. Um, the economy is tough. Uh, people are poor. Many people are living day to day on rice that they can grow um, in, by slash and burn methods, which might produce enough rice for them to eat, uh, or it might not. Uh, they realize that it's not a good, uh, not a not a, a a good solution for long term farming in terms of of caring for the soil over the long term. But people essentially have no choice. So it's a situation where there really are no villains. Um, in most cases, now we do have the precious wood problem, and I would say that that yes, there are villains in that case, but but a lot of the damage in Madagascar, the environmental damage has come simply from subsistence agriculture, slash and burn agriculture um, over the years, and that's just having a, a, an enormous impact over time as the as the population grows. So, you know, we try to address that in different ways. You know, I mentioned environmental education, educating um, uh, students, young people, making them aware of the problems, working in sustainable agriculture, trying to enable people to, to, to change their agricultural techniques to more sustainable methods that don't uh, harm the land so much. That they, they can farm in one area and not have to cut more and more forest. Uh, you know, we collaborate with the, the government protected areas uh, department, ministry, and the, the Water and Forest Department in, in, in past years. We've been involved, we're, we're involved now in, in fish farming, trying to, to um, show people techniques of raising fish, giving them the, the means to raise fish, a, an alternative means of protein to hunting, bushmeat hunting, hunting animals for, for their protein. Um, so all these things uh, together and what we call capacity building or training within the national, the population of Malagasy nationals, you know, and all the years that, that I've been involved with uh, in Madagascar, you know, we've seen a real train, a, a real change and the number of conservation trained conservation professionals coming up through the through the ranks when we first started in Madagascar in the late 1980s there were almost zero so we are seeing a change the frustrating part is we're not seeing change come fast enough I mean we need we need change to come quickly there the forest is still disappearing the population is still growing um, uh, so we just have to keep keep um, pecking away at, at what we're doing and and trying to make small small differences and 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 fostering their growth hoping that they that that they will bring bring uh, positive results over time right and Eric you've actually been on the ground in Madagascar in the Sava region which is actually an acronym that I'll let you explain because I'm bound to forget what one of those A's stands for. <laughs> Um, but you've actually been on the ground implementing the Lemur, one of the Lemur Center's most recent uh, conservation projects. Can you tell us a little bit about the Sava project? Sure. Well, like Charlie was explaining, I mean, what we're doing now in the Sava region of northeastern Madagascar, and that stands for Sambava, Andapa, Vohemar, and Antala, four cities in the region. What we're really doing is 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 extending upon and building upon what Charlie. And, and his wife Andrea have done over many years in the, in the not so far Tamata region. So we're building upon their, their decades plus worth of experience and applying that to a new area. And first and foremost, uh, environmental education. Um, we've, been, we've, we've worked with the same Tamata trainers that they've had out there. And what we're trying to do is institute a new environmental education teacher training manual as part of the primary school curriculum so that it is required in the primary schools. And that's actually been very successful. We've had teachers come from 
many, many kilometers away for these for these five day workshops where they're receiving clear training and how to use this new manual. So we're very excited about that. That that's already been a success. We've had several large trainings already. Aside from the teacher trainings, we're also bringing young students tomorrow, Jeji, for three three day two night two night eco tours in the national park. And that's been a real hit too. I mean, children really just love to see the sulky safakas. They're one of the largest animals in, in, on the island, actually. They're one of the largest lemurs, and they're just visually beautiful animals. They're highly social animals. They're fun to watch, and and kids really have their eyes popping out um, when they go up there. And uh, they don't just see sulky safakas; they see reptiles and plants and all kinds of birds and Really, it's, it's a very popular program, but it, we only can bring up about a dozen kids at a time. So it's not the same as, as institutionalizing a new environmental education curriculum, which, which was our, our first and foremost goal. But aside from that, um, we're also engaged in uh, developing a lot of fish farms. Uh, there's an endemic species of freshwater fish. The genus is Paratilapia, and it's a wonderful fish, really, because it's almost locally extinct in the in the freshwater streams um, and it breeds actually breeds quite easily it eats almost anything so our, our goal is to establish these local fish ponds and and we do have a collaborator who's excellent at this and has a lot of the little the little fishlings which is often the limiting factor he has almost an unlimited supply of these little fishlings so villages villagers are able to to eat 75% of the fish, but 25% of the fish are actually reintroduced locally. So we're both providing an alternative source of protein, but restocking um, local streams as well. And we also have a number of um, research initiatives, and we're, we're, we continue to regularly do surveys for sulky safakas. In many cases, we work with students from Duke University. We just hosted a master's student whose project was to do population surveys for all lemurs, including silkies, in two different parts of the reserve. By doing that, we not only clear out traps, we identify habitat disturbance, but we also get updated data on the abundance of lemurs in different parts of the reserve. But one of the, the strongest things we do in general is we, we work in, in remote, underserved areas. You know, like many parks, we have a highly visited end of the park. We have a, a side of the park that has a main road. And historically, that, that eastern side of the, the, par the park has received the most attention, just for logistics reasons. But we're really working hard on the west side now. The west side of Marojeji, people are, are, are really suffering. Poverty is much higher. Educational level is much lower. It, there's no roads there, so it's 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 a several days walk to access that side of the park, and not surprisingly, habitat disturbance is a lot worse over there. So we're really trying to do a lot more over there. We're building a school over there. Actually, um, we have a couple fish fund projects over there, and we're also developing a lot of uh, several several of our reforestation projects are are also going to be on the west side. And Charlie already touched on the reforestation initiative. That's another big project that we're involved with. There's there's not been a serious reforestation project in this region in, in many years. So. so I might just comment on one thing that, that Eric mentioned. He mentioned that we're building uh, a school. And, uh, you know, when you talk about conservation, you think about conservation, you don't think of that as being really such a, how is that related to conservation? Well, um, as Eric mentioned, it's, it's in a really remote area. It's two days walk from the nearest road. Um, it's an area that hasn't had much contact from the outside. It's an underserved area. Um, but by going into this area and working with people and helping them to do something positive, you gain, um, you gain their trust. You build a relationship with these people um, instead of just going in with uh, and, and and saying, well, you can't do this, you can't do that, you know, you can't go into the reserve, you can't cut trees, you, you go in slowly, you build relationships, and that's really a, a, a big part 
is working with people and building these relationships and 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 convincing them in the end that that conservation is just as much in their interest as as uh, as it is in the interest of, of plants and animals and and the outside world yeah <laughs> yes <laughs> absolutely um, there was an article I wish I could remember who it was from that came out just a couple of weeks ago talking about um, uh, how conservation strategies in the past sometimes used to be money drops go in spend a lot of money um, sort of tell folks in their communities how they should be doing things and then you leave and and at least hope that some of it sticks but um, conservation strategies that seem to be the most successful are the long-term projects. MFG and Duke Lemur Center has been in Madagascar since 1988, I think. About, yeah. So in the late 80s. Late 80s. Developing relationships with people that yes through the future. People who know that you're there uh, to actually improve their situation. Well, I, I would just, real quickly, Eric, sorry, but I would just say that, that, yeah, that's certainly right. We've seen in the years that we were in Madagascar, and I'm sure Eric has seen the same thing, we've seen these big money drops. Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of money dropped into a project over a short period of time. The organization pulls out and poof, everything goes back to the way, to the way that it was. Um, so... Yes, just like Chris said, we we believe strongly in, in long-term projects. It's just what it takes. Right. Did you have a comment, Eric? Um, do we want to um, start hitting some of these um, audience questions? Yeah, I think we should. So we'll, we'll start with one of the first ones we gave, uh, got in here from, let's see. We have a question from David who was wondering how the decline in lemur populations affect the ecosystem in general. Gary? Well, um, a, a number of ways. I mean, I, specifically about the sulky sifaka, um, they certainly, uh, as the largest bodied um, native mammal in Marojeji, sulky sifakas are the largest bodied native mammal in Marojeji. They, they're an important source of food for the fusa. I, I hate to say, fusa are their main predator. And historically, um, no, there probably were large, large raptors that also predated on the silky sifaka. They're now extinct. Um, silky sifaka still react to, to a number of, of, of remaining raptors. But surely some of these recently extinct raptors that just went extinct a few hundred years ago um, in the genus Aquila and Stephanoids, kind of like the Marshall Eagle of Africa. Silkies were an important source of food for them. Silkies sifakas also defecate quite a lot. <laughs> we collect a lot of their poop, and, and surely their, their large feces is, is important for the forest. I know that there are dung beetles. Uh, there's a huge diversity of dung beetles in Madagascar, and many of them um, require a lot of lemur poop. Silky sifakas, I would like to say that they're, they're regular seed dispersers, but I can't really say that because most of the time, silky sifakas are seed predators. They, they often prefer to eat the inner seeds. However, there are some very small seeds, like seeds of ficus, that surely they, they must pass through their system. And um, yeah, yeah. So they are important to the ecosystem, definitely, definitely. But it'll still require uh, more work. To, to specify um, precisely what ecosystem services um, they provide. Next I'm question. Yeah. Grad school project for you. Yeah, yeah. Some Duke students on it. That's so, right. Uh, the next question from Charlie Moores. Lemurs used to be protected through local superstitions. Has that changed? Well, it, uh, great question from Charlie. Hi, Charlie. Great to hear from you. Um, well, it really depends on the lemur species, you know. Um, the Tattersallies in the Tattersally Safaka in Dorena, not far from Marojeji, they've always had more of a taboo against lemur hunting. But for the Silky Safaka in the Marojeji region, we there's never actually been a clear taboo. Um, we've done a lot of interviews, a lot of surveys about taboos, 
And the last time we did a survey about taboos, I think only one household out of 400 reported that the, the silky safaka was taboo to hunt. So, so as far as we know, there's never actually been a, a taboo against hunting the silky safaka or really any of the other lemurs in the Marojeji region. But, um, but, it, but, it, but it's a little bit of a mystery why uh, in Dorena, not so far from Marojeji, uh, um, 200 kilometers, um, the Tattersawi safaka has, has received more protection from, from local taboo. But of course we've heard that's changing as well. As migrants come in to, to, to take gold uh, in that region, the, the taboo, uh, the former taboo against hunting Tattersawi safaka is, is, is breaking down as well. So. Excellent, excellent. Uh, let's see, Laura. Uh, it looks like Laura may have seen the documentary before, so uh, hopefully we won't spoil this too much. Um, but uh, how how are the troops that you tracked for the actual filming in this documentary? How are they doing? They're actually doing very well. Um, Will William is doing wonderfully. Um, he's still in the group, and I hope he stays a long time. But, but as we know, as is often the case, as, as males reach adulthood, um, even if the resident adult male is their father, um, they may be unlikely to stay. He, he'll probably disperse naturally within a couple of years. Um, the Makira group in the documentary um, is doing all right also. They're struggling. They're more in a disturbed forest. And we actually, one of the individuals that we captured in, in the film, um, a sub-adult female has has left the group. She dispersed naturally, and um, we followed her for for about six weeks. And she she went 15 kilometers away. She had a radio collar on. That was the benefit. So we were able to. It was the first time we ever were able to track a dispersing individual. That's the benefit of the radio collar. But it was sad where she went. You know, there there really isn't a good place to go where where she is um, and uh, the forest that, that we that we left her in was contained a lot of traps and a lot of disturbance and uh, it's a challenging situation it reminds us how lucky we are to have the, the large um, national park of Marojeji but also how lucky we are to have the the collaboration of, of WCS it, it's because of w, the Wildlife Conservation Society that 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 small population Makira is still there. So um, yeah, they're all doing well, but they're all struggling in different ways. Wow. Uh, well, we'll keep moving because uh, we have more questions. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Jennifer would like to know what led you to study the silky safak in particular. Well, I, I was a volunteer research, research assistant in the year 2000 in Madagascar. And um, I was just about to start a PhD program, but I didn't have a specific project yet. And I was reading a lot and talking to a lot of people. And it was a professor at Stony Brook University, Dr. P Patricia Wright, who suggested that, that I take a look at this silky safak in Marojeji because it hadn't really been studied yet in detail. And it was also very rare. And uh, that's how it all got started. Um, I, got a, I talked to a lot of people, and uh, it was an opportunity to study an animal about which not, not much was known. Excellent. Um, is there anything in particular about this, this is my question now. I think uh, is is there anything in particular? Is there anything uh, special moments or behaviors um, or interesting things that people who are going to be tuning into the documentary should look for? Well, actually, um, look at their pink faces. You know, it's it's rather it, it's remarkable how quickly silky safakas depigment. They're all born with black faces, but more quickly and I say more quickly than any other mammal on the planet, they start to lose their black pigmentation and develop pink faces. And it's not entirely clear why. It's not albinism. They're not albinos. They're, they have leucism. They're leucistics. 
but the cause of this leucism is not entirely clear. We propose that it might be a vitiligo-like condition, but a lot more research is required. But take a look at how pink their faces get. That's kind of interesting. Oh, wow, excellent. All right, so we've got 10 minutes before the documentary is going to air. Uh, so I'll put one last question that I'd like um, for Charlie and Eric to both answer. Um, and that is, what, what do you hope that this film does? Uh, the documentary, uh, having seen part of it, it is very moving. So, so what do you hope that the documentary does for folks that watch it? Why don't you go first, Eric? <clears throat> well, we hope the documentary inspires people to, to pay attention to critically endangered animals around the world because there are other animals like the sulky safaka out there. There are a lot of other animals that haven't been studied in detail and, and whose population numbers are declining. Um, we also hope that it inspires people to pay more attention to where your wood comes from. You know, where there's very little rosewood left in the world and most of the rosewood now that that's imported and exported from anywhere is with conservation programs at your local zoo through your local school Lots of things that, that, can, that can be done um, locally as well. I, yeah, I think, I think I would echo what, what Eric said. Um, the film is a great, I think, education tool. You know, people have a curiosity about Madagascar and what Madagascar is like, and you certainly can't capture what all, capture what all of Madagascar is like by filming in one area, but in this particular area, the rainforest, which is the eastern part of Madagascar, it, it, it gives you a really wonderful feel of what that forest is like. And you even, I think, get a feel for how special it is and, and, um, and, and how it, it really needs to be protected, you know, the animals and, and the forest. In terms of the the wood, I think it's it also is another um, education aspect that that people aren't always aware. They don't have a way of it's not reported. They don't have a way of being aware that perhaps the wood products that they use come from illegally from from developing countries, from developing tropical countries. So um, it's. Um, it's 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 a way of letting people know that, and you know this, the um, the the particular case with with Gibson guitar in the United States. Well, that's a small part of that the the wood actually, you know. And I think that it's mentioned at the film that a lot of that is going, most of that is is going to China, um, but most people just simply aren't aware of, of how this wood is coming coming out, these precious woods, and, and how it impacts the country that the wood is, is coming from. So I think that's really important to help people understand that. And, and it's also important uh, to understand that, that this Gibson case was, um, I, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Eric, I believe it was the first time that the 2008 amendment of the Lacey Act was actually enforced or that was, that someone was charged with violation of, of that, that, that amendment of the Lacey Act, which is very, very important amendment that, that limits the um, illegal sourcing of woods is what they call it, but essentially it's just using woods that are coming into the U.S. illegally. And, um, and that goes beyond, beyond even environmental concerns, um, protecting the forest kinds of concerns. That also impacts our timber industry here in the U.S. Uh, so I think, I think it, the, the film sheds light on, on, on a variety of subjects that it's uh, it's important for people to know about. Excellent. All right. So thank you so much, Eric, for tuning sure. in. Sure.
Sure. Are, I think everybody's looking forward to, to this documentary now. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, it should be excellent. And we'll be back here um, at, at 9 p.m. Uh, after the show. Yeah, for more questions. And there is, do we have time to respond to Charlie Moore's follow-up question? Yeah, let me, well, before before we do that, let me go ahead and, and get the plug in there. That, sure, yeah. Uh, we will be live tweeting during the documentary from the Lemur Center's Twitter handle, which is at Duke Lemur Center, and we'll be using the hashtag Save Lemurs. So the pound sign, Save Lemurs, all in one piece together. Uh, you can search for that on Twitter and follow the conversation. Uh, Charlie and I will be live tweeting the documentary, so I have comments from Charlie along with his experience uh, having practiced conservation on the ground in Madagascar as we watch the documentary and all of the great stuff that's coming out of the documentary. So yeah, we did have another question from Charlie um, about the female moving into the less well-protected part of the forest and an issue with genetic bottlenecking. Certainly, their their numbers are becoming very small in in, in certain parts of Makira, um, and uh, that group in particular, we thought that was the only group within thirty kilometers, and we had looked for other groups, we'd not found any other groups. So absolutely, we're concerned about genetic bottlenecking, and uh, actually, um, one of the, the we had a population geneticist with us on the last darting trip. And he's in the process of, of, of analyzing the, the blood he collected precisely for that region. But it's my understanding that those that those effects can take a little can take a, um, some time to, to appear in a population. And um, there may be more gene flow than we realized. I ju just today I got an email from our team in Makira with that very group. I had asked them to go back there to see if the radio collars were still working and to get another two months of GPS points on that group. And they just came back to the city and they told me that a new male had shown up that was trying to force his way into the group, fighting with the resident male, which, which is actually great news, which shows that, that there are some other groups out there that, that we weren't able to find. Or, or maybe that male traveled 30 kilometers to fight his way in. I don't know. But in, but in any case, it, it is a little it's reassuring. That that there there may be more gene flow than than we realize at first, um, but um, certainly genetic bottlenecking is is something that we need to pay attention to. Excellent. All right. Last reminder, everybody. Uh, we will be back on Google Plus for another hangout on air after the documentary to take more questions and talk about the things that you've just seen. We'll be live tweeting from at Duke Lemur Center using the hashtag Save Lemurs. We hope you guys enjoy the Frontier Earth episode tonight, 8 o'clock. You've got two minutes on Animal Planet, and then we'll see you guys back here after 9. Thank you, Eric. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks, Thank you. Chris.